Now let's see what the 2 Peter said. We're looking at the Bible before we go look at the spirit of prophecy. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, we want to look at verses 3 and 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, According as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. That's what the scriptures does through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4 now. Let's look at verse 4. This is very important. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Saints, don't miss this. What are given to us? Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Brothers and sisters, Peter says that through Jesus is given to us exceeding great and precious promises that you and I might become partakers of the divine nature. When Jesus came, divinity was united with humanity, and but it did not sin. The, Jesus came so that you and I could become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So brothers and sisters, the purpose of Jesus is not only to redeem us, but to restore us to the point that we were before sin ever the end of the world. Are you hearing me saying? Look at this thing. Now let's go to the, what the prophet said. The prophet says, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is the redemption plan so this is a plan, the redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. So God not only came to redeem us, but we must be restored. And in this redemption plan, we must also be restored. Peter says that re restoration is to bring us back to the divine nature. In other words, to bring us back to where we can become partakers of the divine nature, to bring us back to the point that Adam and Eve were in before sin ever entered into this world. So to redeem us and restore us, get this, saints, this is very important. The redemption plan is the redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul are the image of God. Now I want you to key in on restoration because that's what Peter's talking about. Key in on now restoration. Look what the prophet says. So here is the redemption plan. The redemption plan is laid out in the sanctuary. Look at this thing. Get it now. I, I'm going to take my time here. The whole redemption plan is laid out in the sanctuary. From Genesis to Revelation. That's the redemption plan. In Genesis, look what the prophet is going to say. She'll tell you something. Just watch. The sanctuary has an outer court, a holy place, and a most holy place. This is where it's laid out. This is the plan of redemption. It's laid out in one year of that sanctuary service represents the whole plan of salvation. God laid it out. Let him act it out so that we could not miss it. All we have to do is read, thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. That's reading, she says, the sanctuary is the key. All we have to do is understand the sanctuary. Oh, brothers and sisters, there's so much that we need to share. We're going to share it, though. We're going to, we're going to take our time. Look, let's go now. Look what the prophet says now. She says, from the first intimation of hope in the sinners pronounced in Eden, the first intimation of hope was Genesis 3, 15. From the first intimation of hope, in other words, when man sinned, this is what God says, Genesis 3.15, I will place enmity. You know, this, you know the text. To that last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their forehead. Now, brothers and sisters, this is in, our, this is in the newsletter. From the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in the Garden of Eden, to that last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face 
and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, brothers and sisters, if, if, if God's going to put his name, let's go there. Revelation 22, verses 4. Let's go there. Revelation 22. I want to take our time, saints. Revelation 22, verses 4. The Bible says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, bring this out in the newsletter. If God is going to put his name in our forehead, that means that these people are sealed. And then when, when, when we read this in Revelation 24, 22, 4, that these people are in heaven. They, and so they have God's name in their forehead. So now we found out that in, in Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 14, that God puts it, that's the seal. When God seals us, he puts his name in our forehead. So the people in Revelation 22, 4 have been sealed. And in the newsletter, I go back and show when they were sealed. Were they sealed once they got to heaven? Were they sealed during the seven last plagues? Were they sealed before Christ ever stood up in the most holy place and said, he that is just, let him be just? When were they sealed? That's the issue. Because whenever they were sealed, that means at that point in time, they had victory over sin. God is not going to put his seal on anybody that's still breaking his law. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So then his name is in their forehead. Now let's go back to, the, to our screen. From the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in, the, in Eden to that last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their forehead. Revelation 22, 4. The burden, she says, the burden, the burden of every book, every book from, from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation, the burden of every book, she says, and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. Ellen G. White calls it a wondrous theme. She says, in, what, does, what does Peter say? Peter says, uh, what does, let's go back to Peter. Let's go back to Peter. I want to get it. I want to make sure we tie this together. Uh, I can quote it, but I want us to see it from, I want to see it from, the, let's go back to 2 Peter. I want us to see this thing. Say. Look what Peter says. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So Peter calls it exceeding great and precious promises. Ellen G. White calls it a wondrous theme. It's a wondrous theme that man can be brought to a point where he will not sin. She says, the burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme, man's uplifting the power of God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. But this is powerful stuff, saints. Satan does not want us to understand this. Continue on. So, from Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation, that's the, that's the burden of every book, is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. Peter says, exceeding great and precious promises. Paul talking to Timothy says, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scripture which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Look at this thing, brothers and sisters. Look at this thing. So, in the sanctuary, out here, in the outer court, is Eden lost. Over here in the most holy place is Eden regained. That's where you get your name, God's name in your forehead. Out here is where God had to leave. The outer court lines up, the Eden lost lines up with the outer court. And Eden regained lines up with the most holy place. Saints, don't miss this. Please do not miss this. Don't let, Lord, I hate to say it, but don't let uh, men who have been miseducated, that's what has happened. They have been miseducated. They have been educated away from the truth, just the same as the Jews were when Jesus came. How could the Sanhedrin, the Jews, Caiaphas, and Ananias, who were the leaders of the Jewish nation, how could they kill the Messiah? What happened? Why did these people do that? Why did they persuade the common people on that Thursday night to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus? Why did they do that? 
Brothers and sisters, we are in the same condition. Ellen G. White tells us in Helpful Living, page 280, that we are repeating the history of that people. Saints, let's open our eyes up. So Eden lost. This is Eden regained. Brothers and sisters, the altar in the outer court is where the plan started. Once man sinned, Adam and Eve had to bring an offering because the wages of sin is death. And that first lamb that was crucified pointed to Jesus dying on the cross. Now, saints, get this point now. This is very important. I want you to know that the lamb was slain in the outer court. In Genesis, when man sinned, he had to bring a lamb. That lamb pointed toward Jesus Christ. And in the sanctuary service, every time a man brought a lamb to atone for his sin, to, 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 to die for his sin, it pointed toward Jesus Christ who would come and die. But please understand that the lamb died in the outer court. Please understand this. Now, but the sanctuary, the whole sanctuary represents a plan of redemption. But it just starts in the outer court. You understand what I'm saying? This thing? It starts in the outer court. Now watch, let's go. So this is phase one of the plan of redemption, the slaying of the lamb. This was phase one. Thanks for understanding this. The holy place experience is phase two. We're going to come back to this later in, in, in this number nine. We're going to, but I, I have explained this in detail in, this, in, the, in the newsletter. So, so phase two is in the holy place. And phase three of the plan of redemption is in the most holy place. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to get this. The, the prophet says that the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. Peter says that, we, that, that God has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might become partakers of the divine nature. Now, brothers and sisters, the slaying of the lamb does not restore man. It justifies him that blood goes into the holy, but it does not restore him. He does not get restored until the day of atonement in the most holy place. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Follow me. Here is a wreck. This is a car wreck. Many of you look, viewing this DVD have had car wrecks. Car all beat up, and you take it into the body shop. Now, if you took it into the body shop, and when, it, when, when the body shop got through with it, it came back to you looking the same way, it would not be restored. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So let's take this, this car that's been beat up and had a wreck and take it over to the most holy place. Now you see this car has been restored. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? In the Garden of Eden, man had a wreck. And the plan of redemption is to restore man to his original condition. Jesus says, the Bible says that he, God created man in his image. This is in our newsletter. Paul, I mean, Peter says that we can become partakers of the divine nature. Ellen G. White calls it a wondrous thing that we can overcome this sin. The Bible, we just went through the Bible saying it is Christ in us. So brothers and sisters, God not only wants to redeem us, but restore us to our original condition. That's the only way he can put his name in our foreheads. That's what you see in Revelation 22, 4. They shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And the only way that Christ God can put his name in our foreheads is that we have come to a point where we are again sinless. That's what God raised up the seven day Adventist church. That's the message that God raised this church up. That's reading the prophecies. The passing of the time in 1844 opened to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary. 
when the when the pioneers of the 